Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Equityverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about the S&P 500, and we're going to provide a general outlook going into the end of the year. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com, links in the description below. And you can use the code 2023 to get another 10% off your first month in addition to that sale. So make sure you guys check that out. Let's go ahead and jump in. So with the S&P 500, you know, the movements in it, at least for the last three to four months, have been going more or less how, how you might expect based on, on seasonality, right? And we talked about this a lot, right? And one of the things that I, I mentioned back in, you know, going into, into August, so back in like, like late July, early August, is I, I said back then that we are likely going to get a correction. Now, if you're not familiar with the seasonality side of things, um, one of the things that we can always do is we can just go look at the year-to-date ROI of, of the, of the S&P and just see how typically speaking, right? Not always, but typically speaking, we get a correction in Q3 of the pre-election year, right? And we got that correction, right? You can see that we got that correction. It started, you know, really like late July and then finished up by the end of October. This is the average of all pre-election years, this like this teal line. But if you look at individual years, right, you can see that this is a, a correction that we normally get. That's 2019, here is 2015. You also have, have 2011 as well. So it's a fairly standard correction that we've seen. And so going into, into Q3, or really going into, into August, we suggested that there will likely be a correction, right? A five to 10% correction. The narrative, of course, is, is always, you know, the up for discussion. The main, the main reason that I said, of course, besides seasonality, I mean, right, you know, seasonality could be the only reason, right? I mean, when you have a, a, a very bullish year in the index and it's up, you know, it's up 20% by, by the third quarter, it's okay to have a 10% correction. Okay, so that's pretty standard. That was pretty normal to see. But one of the other reasons besides seasonality that we suggested we could see this correction was because of the bond market. And here, I actually, I, I tweeted about this, but I also, I also made, we made, made many, many, many videos on it as well. But if you remember back over here in July, the 10 year, was breaking out, right? So the 10 year was sort of breaking out above these levels, right? Going into August, you can see it was it was testing these levels, trying to break out. And and I even tweeted about it back then, and I, let me get the link here. Um, but I tweeted about it back then, and I said, essentially, that the continued breakout of the 10 year yield could lead to a period where both stocks and bonds fall Many investors have refused to believe the Fed's higher for longer. I'm on for a long time, but I think the Fed will be successful in bringing inflation back down to 2%. So this is, you know, this was posted right here, right, where the 10-year was breaking out. And what's interesting is if you look at where TLT was at the time, so you're looking at, at the bond market, because the idea, again, was both stocks and bonds will fall for the next few months, right, especially during the seasonal, seasonal phase. But if you look at where TLT was at the time, you'll see that it was all the way up here at around 100, okay? Now, from that level, TLT then fell 17.5%, right? So the reason why that's relevant is if if the long end of the yield curve is going up, right? Like if the 10 years going up, if the 20 years going up, if the 30 years going up, that puts down, that puts pressure on, on risk assets, right? It puts pressure on equities. But if the long end of the yield curve is going down, right? If the long end of the yield curve is going down, that, that relieves a lot of that pressure. So, you know, from this level, we saw TLT drop down about 17 to 18%. Now, one of the levels I've been looking at on TLT for a long time as, you know, as a potential area that it could theoretically bottom was between 80 to 85. Okay, so we did at least hit that level. I'm not, I mean, it could be the bottom, right? Like that could be the bottom. But I'm also open-minded to it potentially going a little bit lower. And you know, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. But this is at least a candidate uh, for the bottom. One of the reasons why it, I mean, it might not be, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, is that there's, there, there's, an, uh, there's an idea if, if the Fed funds rate 
is not sufficiently restrictive, right? Like if we're not at a sufficiently restrictive level, then you know it's certainly possible that that the long end of the yield curve could eventually go higher as it starts to potentially uh, suspect that inflation will go back up, right? There is a risk of something like that happening. So we saw TLT drop about 17% from then, and we saw the S&P, right? The S&P also dropped, not, not like quite as much as, as the bond market did from this level, right? But it, it dropped about 10%, right? So the idea was that going into August, you know, really going into August, September, and October, we would go into a period where both stocks and bonds fall, okay? And, and that happened, right? So the stock market fell 10%. And TLT fell about 17%. But the idea, again, is it's because the 10-year was breaking out that was leading to risk assets falling down. That's one potential narrative, right? That's the narrative that I said was the reason why the S&P is going down. But it was also just a favorable outcome as well based on seasonality, how we normally get a correction in Q3 of the pre-election year. But these seasonal corrections in Q3 obviously don't last forever. And, you know, one of the things we said is that you could easily bottom out in, in October and get a, get a rally into the end of the year just based on seasonality, right? Again, this is one of those things where seasonality does not always play out, right? It really doesn't, maybe about 70% of the time. And you can see that this move has just completely gone, you know, back near where it was earlier in the year, okay? So bottoming out around the same time that it tends to bottom out and then getting a fairly nice push up into you know into november so and i i made a video about this i think when the s p was around like 4200 4300 saying that this was the most likely outcome given the fact given the fact that yellen issued shorter duration than the market was expecting has she had she in had she issued longer duration it would have continued to likely put pressure on risk assets as the long of the yield curve continues to go up, right? But because she did not do that, she she opted to issue shorter duration. The long of the yield curve started to fall back in, as you can see with a 10-year yield, right? Late October, it started to fall back in. And of course, TLT started to go up. So this is a potential candidate for the low, but the reason why we can't know that yet is we don't know if you know, if a long of the yield curve is going higher or not, right? It, it's possible that it's gone high enough to slow the economy down, but that's not all that evident yet, right? Like we're still seeing, you know, the economy grow. We're still seeing, I mean, the unemployment rate is trending in the wrong direction, but it's still at relatively low levels at 3.9%. At uh, it's not like it's at 5 or 6% or anything like that. Inflation is still relatively elevated. You would expect in a recession that inflation will you know, be coming down very, very quickly as demand you know, dries up, right? But we haven't reached that stage of the business cycle yet. And you know, there's no way to know exactly how long this process will take. As the 10-year falls back in here, right? I mean, just to see like where the breakout point was, you know, here is the breakout. Here is the breakout point right here. We sort of poked our head above it here in August, then got above it. And now we've more or less come back down to it. So over the next several months, this will be telling, right? Like if, if the 10-year can bounce here, then that would likely put pressure on risk assets. Again, if it falls down, right? If the 10-year falls, then it could still be short-term bullish for stocks because as the long end of the yield curve goes down, the cost of capital is less, and, and therefore, you know, stocks are generally going to find that bullish. But the issue is if the long end of the yield curve is going down because it's starting to sniff out weakness in the economy, then it's only a matter of time before the stock market could follow. Now, it could still take months before that happens, right? Like these things don't play out overnight. If you look at prior business cycles, um, like if you go look at, at like TLT in, in sort of a, a former business cycle and you overlay the S&P 500 onto this chart. So let me do this on a new price scale so that we can uh, make it out a little bit easier here. Um, but if you look at like the financial crisis, right? Like if you go back to the financial crisis over here, this was November of 2008. This is when, so you have the blue line up here. This is the S&P 500. You can see that the S&P topped shortly 
like, I mean, shortly after TLT bottomed, right? So TLT bottomed first, the S&P topped a little bit later. And to get an exact number on that, you know, TLT bottomed in June of 2007, and then the S&P topped out in October, right? So you had, you, had, you had July, August, September, October. You had those four months um, before the S&P really started to turn down. And even when it did turn down, it wasn't obvious that this was what was going to happen next, right? I mean, like, you, you could have still argued that even in November it was a higher low. Um, but of course, it ended up being a lower high, and then the rest is history. And then if you go back and look at, at you know, before that, in the in the dot com crash, let me just pull up. We don't have, I don't have TLT going back all the way that it needs to here. So we'll just pull up. Let's just pull up the ten year, um, and it'll it'll more or less tell us the same thing. If you look at the ten year, you can see that I mean, if the ten year is topping out, then the bond market's ten you know bottoming out. But at the ten year here topped in January of two thousand. The S and P topped in in March of 2000, right? So it only took a couple of months, but it still wasn't known until much later, until August, when we still put in a lower high and then the market trended down. So again, the bond market bottomed first. So, you know, things like the 10 year, the 20 year, they topped first. Then the S&P tops sometime in the nebulous future, right? We don't know if it's going to be a few months, like, you know, we don't know if it's like one or two months or like four or five, but you can see the pattern, right? Like the 10 year tops, it goes down. When it first goes down, it's bullish for risk assets. The issue is if it keeps going down. And you can see that like when it topped over here, when it topped and it came down, the S&P kept going up, right? And I mean, it bounced here, but once, once it really broke down below these levels that it had been holding, that was where the S&P finally started to pay attention, okay? That was where the S&P was like, oh, crap, something's wrong. You know, and, and again, like similar thing over here, right, where you look at where you look at the 10-year yield, where it topped out before the S&P topped out, the S&P did not really start to pay attention until, until the 10-year the broke down below this level. So then you look at it today, you look at it today, and we can see that the 10-year has at least put in a top, right? It's put in a top at around 5%, okay? In the short term, this has been bullish for risk assets, just like it always is, right? Like this isn't that uncommon. And we even said, I mean, I said a few weeks ago at the end of October, early November, I don't remember exactly when, it was whenever Yellen issued the shorter duration, um, I said back then that it was bullish in the short term for both stocks and bonds. The reason why it was bullish for stocks, again, is because lower rates uh, take that pressure off risk assets. The cost of capital is cheaper. The reason it was bullish for bonds is because, you know, issuing lower duration is going to basically is going to basically reduce the pressure on the long end of the yield curve. That's going to come back, um, you know, that's going to come back down, which should which should send send bonds higher. So that has played out so far. Right, that has played out so far. So, I certainly, you know, I certainly have my my fair share of of getting things wrong in the markets. Um, but at least over the last few months, it seems like the market has more or less behaved how we sort of thought it would. Right, correction in August, September, October, short term bullish for both, or you know, bullish, sorry, bearish for stocks and bonds, July through October. And then flipping bullish on stocks and bonds, late October, early November. I think it was late, uh, early November, um, and just kind of recognizing that when stuff like that happens, don't fight the trend, right? And also, seasonality has been favorable, right? Seasonality has been favorable for the S and P as well. And and there's no sense really in in you know in, in spending too much fight time fighting it when when seasonality tends to sort of favor. These, these basically the exact type of price movement that we've seen all year in the S and P 500. So then, where are you know where do we go today? Right, that's the question. That's the the million dollar question, of course. Is is you know where do things go today? Well, the first thing I would say is that you know just like in history, when the ten year you know breaks out here, it's likely going to try to hold this for a while. Like I mean, if it falls below this level like immediately, that would probably be very bearish for the stock market, right? But as we saw throughout, you know, various points in history, it will try to bounce around these levels for a while. 
And, and then eventually, if this level gives way, that is, not, is likely not going to be good for the stock market. Okay. Now, the ultimate question, though, is, is this the top of the 10-year? Because if it's not the top, then you, you kick the can down the road for this whole process, right? Many, many, many months, right? I mean, there's no way to know if it's the top or not. Many people sort of front ran the 10 year for, they've been doing it for a long time, right? They, you know, they, they thought it was gonna top here and then they thought it was gonna top here and then they thought it was gonna top here. But I did not. And, you know, my expectation was that the Fed funds rate would go to five and a half percent. And the reason why I did not buy bonds over here, right? The reason why I did not buy bonds throughout this entire period was because I did not think that the market had yet priced in higher for longer, right? I did not think the I think the market really thought the Fed was bluffing for a long time and and that this, you know, this really structural change in interest rates wasn't going to hold. Think about how many people probably went out and bought houses because, you know, they were they were told, "Oh, well rates will come down, you know, in in a few months and then you can refinance or, you know, next year and then you can refinance." That hasn't happened, right? Rates have continued to go higher. 30-year mortgage, you know, hit over 8% not too long ago. It's since come back down. But that I, I think is is the is sort of the question is, is this the top for the 10-year or is it not? And there's, I mean, first of all, there's no way that I can know the answer to that question. The, the theoretical answer is, is essentially if, if the Fed funds rate, so if the if the Fed funds rate is greater than R star, if the Fed funds rate is greater than R star, then there's a good chance this is at the top. Now, R star is the theoretical rate at which interest rates need to be to sort of change whether the economy would be in contraction or expansion. A lot of economists don't even think R star is even a real thing, right? But there's this idea, there's this theory that there exists an interest rate for which below that level, the economy expands and above that level, the economy contracts. And so the Federal Reserve, I, they have said that they think they are in restrictive territory now. So what they're basically saying is, is they think that 5.5% is sufficiently restrictive. Right. So, I mean, then, you know, it's the, the Fed funds rate is above R star. If it is sufficiently restrictive, then it should start slowing down the economy if it is. Annualized GDP in Q3 was what, like 4.9 percent um, so far in in Q4. I think it's coming in around 2 percent, maybe 2.1 percent or so. We still have plenty of time to go before we'll get that number. But it's the trend that matters. I mean, Q3 of 2007 annualized GDP was 4.9%, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean anything. One of the reasons it can be so high is if a lot of companies are sort of loading up on inventory, they're front loading that. Um, and then if, if the demand falls off, right, then they might not need to get, they, they might not need to get nearly as much inventory in the future, which would then detract from GDP. But this is the question is, is the Fed funds rate higher than our star or not? This is the neutral rate, right? So if, if theoretically, if the Fed funds rate is at the neutral rate, then the economy neither expands nor contracts, okay? But again, the neutral rate is just like some abstract concept. It's not like it's not like we can look at a number and say, all right, well, that is definitely the neutral rate. Like, we don't know. The neutral rate could be 5.5%. It, it could be 4%, or maybe it's 7%, right? There's no way to, to know. Certainly, the Fed think, thinks that they've gone far enough, right? The, the Fed thinks that they've gone far enough and that they are, are sufficiently restrictive. So the thing to look for with, with the stock market is to look at the long end of the yield curve, okay? And we can go take a look at that, right? So we can go take a look at the, the long end of the yield curve. So we'll go look at the treasury yield curve. So remember, inverted yield curves, <laughs> inverted yield curves basically tell you that the economy is sick, okay? That doesn't mean the market can't rally, during an inversion. In fact, more often than not, the market does rally when the yield curve is inverted. It's when it uninverts where a recession is, is potentially the highest risk, right? If you can clearly see that on treasury yield spreads, right? It's upon the uninversion, 
where there's you know a, a more likely a recession in the cards. Now there are periods in the 70s where you had a recession while we were still in the you know while we were still in inverted territory on the yield curve. That was also during a period of high inflation. So it is relevant to think that that could happen again today because we have high inflation. But you know I, I think there's this this prevailing theory, and we've sort of pushed back against this for the better part of two years that there was a a recession in in 2022 because we had two consecutive quarters of negative gdp and you know by, by that technical definition you could call it a recession but normally the nver would look at the unemployment rate and, and other factors sort of declare if it's a recession or not and you know when you think about recession you think about people losing their jobs not at a 50-year low on the unemployment rate so i don't think we've experienced a recession i, I think that this so far has just been a pretty typical bear market uh, that we had from January through October. Um, if it turns into a recession, which it could do, then, I mean, then then you would see the unemployment rate go up and you would see all sorts of other things happen. Okay, which by the way, the unemployment rate is starting to go higher. But remember, I mean, like, again, I think a lot of people with these markets, they they sort of get frozen because they they look at the yield curve and they say, well, crap, right? The economy's sick. That means a crash is coming. Right. But my my view, right, my view for basically the last two years has been that the earliest the recession would arrive would be the end of this year. The earliest it would arrive would be the end of this year. And now we are at the end of this year and we know that the unemployment rate is starting to go higher. Right. So there's no guarantee that it continues higher, but it has started to go higher. And if you apply like a three month moving average, it looks like it's starting to curl up here. Right. You know, it's gone from three point five, the three month moving average up to 3.83 in a relatively short period of time. You know, normally when it starts to curl up, it really starts to move, right? But it, I mean, it plays out so slowly. I mean, we get one data point every month, right? Like there's no way we're gonna know if this is the start of a recession until at least another like six to 12 months more than likely. And if we just start printing unemployment rate again back down here at like 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, then you're just kicking the can down the road even further. So you have to remember that even though you have an inverted yield curve, it doesn't mean that the market can't rally, right? And that's what it's been doing for a long time. And that's what it normally does. Also, the market normally rallies when it sniffs out a Fed pause. So if you were to go look at interest rates, if you were to look at interest rates and, and where the Fed pause is, and then we overlay the S&P 500 onto this chart, you know, once the Fed pauses, the S&P can often rally for a while, right? It rallied here. Um, you know, the Fed paused right here, and we got a, a little bit of a rally. It's common right here. The Fed paused, and we rallied. The, the market normally rallies when the Fed pauses, and that's what it's doing again today. That is not uncommon. So the market tends to rally during a new yield curve. It tends to rally on a Fed pause. Um it loves, absolutely loves climbing the wall of worry. And what I've said is that it, it can do that. It can climb the wall of worry until either you get the reacceleration of inflation or the labor market weakens. So far, the labor market has been relatively tight. In fact, initial claims are still extremely low. I mean, I, I would think you would need to see this printing in like the 300K region to start really you know, thinking that it's recession imminent. Right? I mean, it's still at around 209,000, relatively low in the grand scheme of things. One of the more concerning things, of course, is continued claims. That one has been you know, moving higher, right? So this one has been moving higher. That one's a more concerning metric, but still initial claims is relatively low, meaning that you know, while there have been layoffs, there haven't necessarily been like you know, that much compared to what we would normally get, okay? Continued claims going higher suggests that while people are getting laid off at the same pace as they normally do, they're having a harder and harder time finding a new job. So when it comes to the S and P, I mean, you know, and if you look just look at seasonality, or if you just look at seasonality, then we tend to get a a um, you know a nice move going into the, end of the year. Apple is another good example. You could look at the 2023 year to date return on Apple. And then look all up pre all average of, of all prior pre-election years and see that's pretty much where it normally is, right? Like this is where it normally is at this point in pre-election years, right? You could also average out election years if you want, which would be next year. And you can see that in election years, the returns are not nearly as good on average, right? I mean, you can still, 
you know, on average, it still has gone up 20%, right? But you're not getting the same type of move that you tend to get in, in pre-election years. Um, and if we look, if I add the average of pre-election years on here, you can see that pre-election years are all the way up here, whereas election years are all the way down here. One of the reasons why markets don't like election years is because there's more uncertainty in, in election years because of the elections, right? And so um, I think one of the, that's one of the reasons why in pre-election years, the market just tends to go higher you know, at a, at a fairly brisk pace, but whereas in election years, that's not the case as much, okay? Um, and I mean, you can see like with the S&P, it had a pretty substantial correction over here in early 2020. Of course, that was due to a pandemic, but we did have an inverted yield curve in 2019. And then it also had a fairly substantial correction in, I mean, and this was your, your sort of your Q3 2015 correction, but then it also had another correction in 2016 as well. Pretty similar. And, and it actually went a little bit lower than where it had gone in, in Q3 of 2015. We didn't have a recession right here, but we had a recession scare, right? Like there, were, there was some indicators suggesting that we could be going into a recession. So again, so far, you know, this correction played out like we thought it would in both stocks and bonds. This move higher played out how we thought it would with both stocks and bonds, right? Bonds went up, stocks went up. The main thing to watch for now is how long does the 10-year hold, okay? How long can it hold? And that is what I will be watching. You know, how long does this thing hold up? And it's not just the 10-year. I mean, you can go look at the 30-year as well. You can see that on some shorter time frames, it sort of broke the uptrend that it was on. But it's still above, you know, this prior breakout point, right? It still has plenty of room to work with here. I mean, it could go all the way back down to 4.4%, find support on that, and then eventually move higher. And then TLT could theoretically put on a new low. Um, it all depends on, on if this level that it just hit is sufficiently restricted or not. Um, so that is, you know, that's certainly the thing to look for. And I mean, all of these moves have been getting weaker, right? I mean, I, like the RSI is, is a dubious indicator, but I mean, you can just kind of just, in general, you can see that like this high over here on, on 30 year R, you know, you can see that was higher up than this one. It's even more pronounced, I think, on the 10 year. Yeah, like on the 10 year, each of these highs continues to be just a little bit lower. This was about the same, and then it just kind of keeps going down, right? So like a high, a high, and a higher high. This was a high, and then a lower high, and then a lower high. So it is, it, the trend is weakening, but the thing, with, the thing about RSI is that it doesn't mean that it can't go higher again and just continue to form that divergence, right? It could, it could happen again. So one of the reasons, you know, you have to be aware of, of the yield curve here and, and lo the long end is there is, you know, there is some thought that there's a chance that in order to get to the sufficiently restrictive zone, that the long end of the yield curve needs to go up to where the short end is today, you know, like five and a half percent or so. I don't necessarily know if that's true, right? I don't know if I, if I believe that or not, but there is a chance that that's the case. And, and that's the reason why I'm not willing to, you know, to, to look at, you know, to look at TLT and to say it, it has definitely bottomed. It is possible, right? It's possible that it bottomed at, you know, in this range. It's possible if the tenure, you know, if the, if the long of the, if the long of the yield curve topped out, then it's certainly possible that, 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 I mean, well, I mean, if the long of the yield curve topped out, then yeah, TLT is bottomed. But I don't know if, if the long of the yield curve needs to go back up. And, you know, there's probably going to be a time sometime in the next few months where, where the 10-year tries to hold support and then get some type of a bounce, okay? And the thing to look for will be when it gets that bounce, does it put in a higher high or does it put in a lower high, right? Does it put in a, like, sort of a higher high or a lower high? Here's a good example from, you know, from like, this is this is just before we had a, a pretty big meltdown in the stock market in 2018. You can see that like the, the, the 10 year put in a high and then a higher high and then a higher high, but then it, it eventually broke this structure right here, right? And then look at the S&P during that time, right? The S&P, well, the S&P was already starting to melt down, but you can see the S&Ps melted down right around the time that the 10 year topped. So that was actually a bit more of a, a bit more of a knee jerk reaction. Um, that also did not correspond to a recession, so maybe it's not the best comparison. But that is the relevant thing to look at. Does the has the Fed reached a sufficiently restrictive zone? You know, I think about two years ago, I said that the terminal rate would likely be five and a half percent. 
I mean, I think that's probably the case, right? Like, I don't think they need to go higher, but one of the, I think one of the difficult aspects of it is if the stock market keeps going higher, right? If, if crypto keeps going higher, right? If these, if the trends prevail and because when the markets trend, right, it can take a lot to slow them down, right? It takes the 10 year breaking out sometimes to slow them down. As long as those markets trend, then the wealth effect happens, right? Where people, they, they feel richer. And so they're more likely to go spend more money. And if they're more likely to go spend more money, that's going to increase demand, which puts upward pressure on inflation. And if it puts upward pressure on inflation, then it might mean that the Fed has to keep doing more. So it's basically this game of like, you know, this game that we go back and forth where the Fed tries to raise enough, the market sees, oh, the Fed's done, let's just run. And the market, then the Fed says, oh no, we're not done, we're gonna go up again. And the, the market sort of backs down for a little bit and then thinks the Fed's done again and then the market rallies and we just keep going back and forth. And the question is, is, you know, who's gonna win in the end, right? Well, the stock market, I think the hard part is if the stock market goes up without a substantial correction, how do we get inflation back down to 2%, right? That's sort of the soft landing scenario. I'm not saying it's impossible. It is possible. I mean, you can go look at 1967 as an example where, where we had an inverted yield curve and there was no recession, although we did get a recession a couple of years later and the S&P went on to put in a lower low. But that's sort of the question is, is you know, can they engineer a soft landing or not? History, history suggests that soft landings are not the most likely outcome, but they're an outcome that you should consider because they do sometimes happen. And the question is, is you know, does the Fed reach a level with a, with a terminal rate, with a Fed funds rate, that puts it you know, sufficiently restrictive, but not overly restrictive to slow the economy down too much? The problem is if, like, if the neutral rate is only like 4% or something, and the Fed has gone too far, then we're not going to know that until it's too late, right? And the, the way that that would sort of come up is if you if you were to go look at at the unemployment rate again, right? So go take a look at the um, the unemployment rate, and you can see that it is starting to trend higher. If this continues to surprise to the upside, right? Like if it goes to four percent and like four point three percent, the problem is that when it starts moving, it moves pretty quickly. You can look at a here's a let me switch this over to like a this is a 36 moving 36 month moving average this is a 24 month moving average of the unemployment rate right so like historically when it gets above this level it just keeps going higher right like there's not a lot of instances where it gets above this level and then just stops there are a couple of fake outs here and there right you can see like right here but normally when it gets above this level it, it just it, it keeps trending for a while and the reason is because the Fed has gone too far. Now, we don't know if the Fed has gone too far, but remember, interest rates induce long and variable lags. Like, you don't know the effects until, until you know, 12 to 18 months after they've happened. And by that point, if the Fed, you know, if, if the unemployment rate goes up to, let's say, like 4%, 4.5% or something, it's not like a rate cut is going to immediately fix things, right? If you think about how long it took rate hikes to have an effect, Think about how long it would take rate cuts to have an effect. And that's one of the reasons why the market tends to bottom out on the last rate cut, not the first rate cut. Because normally what happens on the first rate cut is the, the market just says, oh, no, that's not enough. Like, you need to keep cutting. But we're, we're so far away from that scenario right now. Like, we're still, we're still in the phase right now where the market is, is essentially just trying to figure out if, if, the, if the Fed is, you know, if, if we're above the neutral rate or not, you know? And again, so far, the economy is still growing. The economy is still growing. There's no clear sign that, that it's slowing down in, in, in terms of, you know, in terms of like GDP. You could look at other things and see that it's slowing down. Right? Like you go look at the ISM, the PMI stuff, and see that it's slowing down. You could look at the unemployment rate and see that it's slowly trending higher. But there's other areas that it's not. Like initial claims are still relatively low. Um, you know, the coincident economic activity index, while it is trending lower, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, like it, it is trending lower. So this one co coincident economic activity index, it still hasn't rolled over like it normally would in a recession, right? Like normally in a recession, it sort of levels out or, or goes down. It hasn't done that yet. It's still trending up, but the rate at which it's trending up is slowing down. And you can see that by looking at a month over month change, right? So like if you look at the month over month change, the, the pandemic drop really, really kind of distorts most things. But if you zoom in over here, 
the month over month change of the of the coincident economic activity index, which by the way, it, it is a comprehensive picture based on non-farm payroll, average hours worked in manufacturing, the unemployment rate, and real inflation adjusted personal income, it's trending down, right? So this index is still trending up, but it's trending up at a slower pace. Look at the month over month change. It's kind of noisy. So I tend to like to add like a three month moving average, right? So you can see that it's trending down, right? Like, so in September, 2021, it was at 0.8% on average, three month average, 0.8. Then by January, 2022, it was at 0.6. Then by June of 2022, 0.4. Then by June of 2023, 0.3. And then today, 0.243, right? So it is slowing down, right? Like the, you can see that the, 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 the economy is slowing down some. It's not going up as much as it was. The question is, is, you know, can the Fed engineer it in a way that stops it before this thing goes negative? Because when this thing goes negative, right, that's where you get your recessions, right? When it goes negative or when it's basically about to go negative, right? Like you can see here, the recession started when this thing was at um, 0.117. This recession started when it was at 0.09. Um, these recessions over here, this one started when it hit 0.11. This one started when it hit 0.096. This one started when it hit, you know, about 0.06. Again, today it's at 0.243. And it just had a pretty big drop actually, because it went from 317 down to two, four, three. This is a pretty big drop on the three month, the three month SMA of this. We haven't seen as, you know, this is a, a larger drop than we've seen in a while. One of the reasons is because if you just look at the raw data, you can see that, you know, these two data points right here, relatively low is this one that's, you know, that was relatively high. Um, so this is, is something we have to watch. And if you're curious, you know, you know, what these are, again, are made up of, I already mentioned it, but the unemployment rate, it's been going up, right? Which is one of the reasons this has been slowing down because the unemployment rate goes into that. Real inflation adjusted personal income, right? So if you go look at, and then there's there's um, average hours worked in manufacturing, but let's just go look at real personal um, income. Right here. It actually went down this past month, right? You zoom in here, it actually went down. So that, that's why it's slowing. And if you look at the month over month change of this, the month over month percentage change, right? You can see that it, it's been slowing down here. So that's why that index that we just showed you has been slowing down. This is one of the things that go in, that's going into it that, I mean, you cannot clearly see. The other reason is because the unemployment rate is going up, right? So obviously the index is gonna slow down as the unemployment rate softens up. The other one was average hours worked in manufacturing. So we'll go over to average hours worked per week. We'll go take a look at manufacturing. And you can see that it just ticked down from 40.1 to 40. Not a huge change, right? It's not a huge change, but it is notable because it was at 40, you know, it was at 40.1 from April until September, and then it just dropped down to 40. So again, like there is some slowdown. It's not a lot, but it is there. These are the reasons why, you know, these are the reasons why you're seeing this index trend down. Or not trend down, but slow down. And the last one was non-farm payroll. So we'll go take a look at, at non-farm. So here's non-farm private payroll employment level. Um, this one, you know, if you look at a month over month percentage change, and we'll, I mean, you can you can zoom in. It's been slowing down, right? Let's tune out some of the noise and look at a three month moving average. You can see it pretty clearly, right? It, it has been slowing down. This, in fact, this level here is the lowest it's been since early 2021 right? The lowest it's been since early 2021. Unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of data. We just have it going back to 2010. Um, but I mean, generally, you know, you don't, this entire period over here, we did not have a recession and it was positive the whole time, right? Over here, it started to go negative And then we ended up getting, you know, we ended up getting a recession. Yes, it was a black swan. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't have had something, but um, something to consider. This is starting to go down pretty quickly, right? I mean, the, the three month moving average of this thing is down to is down to 0.0988%. Just the normal number is down to 0.0876%. Right? 
So like some of these data points, like the next data point is going to remove this one at 0.14. And, and if it's somewhere down here, then it's going to even you know, create further drag. So it's a tricky game because you know, I, I think like sort of the, the, the general sentiment is that by a lot of people is that if you have an inverted yield curve, that means recession now. When that's not the case, it does not mean recession now. Um, it means some you know, recession later. That's what it normally means is recession later. It doesn't mean recession now. A lot of people get stuck sitting on their hands and, and not investing because of that, right? They just sort of sit on the sidelines and they don't invest in anything because of that. Um, and that's not how I navigate the market, right? Like with the, and I've told people on, on the ITC premium stuff this, you know, every single month, basically for the last several years, I tune all that out. I mean, with the S and P, I just invest based on the risk level. The same thing I do with, with, um, with, with, with Bitcoin. It's just based on, on the risk level, the S and P 500 risk, as long as it's below a certain risk level, then I'm a happy buyer, right? As long as it's below a certain risk level. Um, and that risk level can vary from one phase of my life to another. Um, at sometimes it's been higher. Like, you know, for a lot of my life, it was 0.75. Um, I was happy. Now it's a little bit lower than that, maybe around like 0.7 or so. Um, right now, the risk on the S&P is 0.684. Okay. And I mean, you can see like when it comes down to these low risk levels down here, that tends to be a, a fairly attractive opportunity in the S&P 500. So, I mean, I, I mentioned just a few weeks ago, on ITC premium, you know, that I was, I was buying it at, at around 41 to 4,200 because the risk was low enough, right? Like the risk was low and it was only compounded by the fact that we have this favorable seasonality going into the end of the year. And, you know, and we have, um, Yellen issuing shorter duration than the market was expecting. We had that. So we had the, the long of the yield curve going down. So, you know, the question is, is how long does this last? I did want to mention, I'm not much of a gap trader. And by I'm not much of one, I mean, I'm not one at all. Like, I don't really care about them. But I, I do, like, I did notice that, that you know, a lot of the gaps did eventually get filled that a lot of people were looking at. And I believe the last gap just got filled here on the S&P. So, I mean, I wouldn't be that surprised if there's some type of a pullback. I mean, this is an explosive rally. I mean, this is, we don't get rallies like this that often in the S&P where it goes up like 11% in, in a few weeks. That's not a very common move to see. So we could get a pullback. I think more times than not, we, we do get a pullback after a, a, a move like that. But we also know that that seasonality still theoretically favors um, the, you know, the market to sort of slowly grind higher in, in December. The only way that that, the, well, I, not the only way, but like the, there's always geopolitical risk and all sorts of stuff. But I mean, the, the way that that might not happen is if like, let's imagine December gets here and we get the unemployment rate and it comes in like way above what people are expecting, right? I think consensus right now is 3.9%. Let's say it just flashes a four handle, but that could spook the market, right? That could spook the market and be like, oh crap, like we're no longer in the threes anymore. And, and you know, as it gets to 4%, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, you're starting to get closer to triggering the, the SOM rule recession indicator. It hasn't triggered yet, but it is getting relatively close. The creator of the SOM rule recession indicator thinks that it will trigger in the coming months. But she said that even though she thinks it'll trigger, she suspects we will avoid a recession. So, I mean, she's, she thinks that this time will be different. Um, you can also look at the SOM rule recession indicator. We created it per state. A lot of the states are relatively um, low. Like, I mean, like Colorado is, is coming up to that threshold now, but it hasn't crossed it yet. Um, but it is coming up to that level. And you can see there's plenty of times where it went up to that level and it did not mean a recession. When it goes well above that level, that can often mean a recession. If you look at Connecticut, it's relatively low, right? It's nowhere close to triggering the SOM rule. But if you go look at the District of Columbia, it, it triggered it long ago. It started to come back down here a little bit, but it triggered it long ago. And there's periods over here, right, where it went up and then came back down and then went up again. The One of the ones that is, is concerning as well is California. You know, California triggered the SOM rule, uh, you know, a while back. It is starting to roll over a little bit, though. Okay. So, you know, it's hard to know if you're going to get something like this over here where it, you know, goes up, it comes back down, and then it goes up again. Um, this is also coming out of a period of high inflation. And, you know, I think Powell will stay the course until the job is done. You know, whether it means just holding at 5.5% for far longer than the market thinks, or whether it means raising rates beyond 5.5%, going to, like, 4.5%. 
six percent or something just to show the market that they mean business and they're going to achieve their target hopefully they can achieve it by just keeping rates at, at five and a half percent and just if you're curious we'll just click on a few random states just so if you're watching maybe you're, you'll be interested here's new york um it's starting to trend up it's so like if you zoom in it was trending up and then it came back down and now it started to trend trend back up again um wisconsin it just triggered the som rule uh, you can see that it just triggered it. It's actually moving up pretty quickly here in Wisconsin. Um, let's go look at Virginia. It moved up and then it came back down and now it's starting to go up again. It's pretty noisy on, on the state level, right? It's pretty noisy on the state level. Here's New Jersey. New Jersey looks pretty bad. You know, it triggered it triggered earlier this year and it isn't hasn't really shown any signs of, of slowing down here. In fact, if anything, it almost looks like it's been accelerating to some degree. Nebraska. It triggered in 2022, then came back down. Now it's starting to go back up again. And you can see there's periods like that in the past, like where it goes up, comes back down, and then goes up again. Tennessee. Oregon. North Dakota. Wyoming. Pretty interesting trends. Louisiana. Indiana. I'm just sort of doing it so you, if you if you live in that state and you're curious, you can just pause it and, and see. Um, Hawaii. I think Hawaii was pretty you know pretty low still. Um, I went through and looked at all of them at one point. Kentucky. Kentucky starting to show some some weakness here, starting to go up. But again, I mean, you know, you still have most of the states have not triggered the SOM rule, which is why on the national level, it hasn't triggered yet, but it's getting close. So that's where we are. That is sort of my view on the S&P right now. It loves, it loves climbing the wall of worry. And, um, and you know, I mean, it, it can always continue to do so until it has a sufficient, sufficient reason not to. So just remember, after, rate, after the Fed pauses, the S&P tends to rally. During an inverted yield curve, the S&P tends to rally. Um, and it's only, it's only once the labor market really finally gives way that it'll, it'll start to pay attention. But there's no, there's no way to know how long that, that's going to take. Like it could be, could be a couple months from now, could be a year from now. Right? I don't know. Um, but that's my view on the market. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you do like the content, make sure you subscribe, give the video a thumbs up. And again, we do have the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at IntoTheCryptoverse.com. Links in the description below. And you can get access to a lot of these charts that we, you know, we were showing. And you can sort of peruse them at your, you know, at, at, your, at your will there. Uh, and you can even use code 2023 at checkout to get another 10% off on your first month. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.